allow me to set the scene. The heroes, worn down and haggard from their earlier bandit ambush, at last crest the grassy hill they had been climbing. All at once, they realize their worst fears have become reality. Ahead, they see a raging bonfire, and around it, dancing and barking in their demonic language, Knowles. The fire is in the middle of a Stonehenge-esque ritual site, and two gnolls, larger and wearing headdresses made of what looks to be black feathers and humanoid jawbones, stand closest to the fire, their hands extended and their barking incantations near screaming volume. This is what I'm going to call the classic ritual encounter. I'm sure you've played in a campaign or ran a campaign where a ritual encounter took place. They're pretty common and can make for an interesting break from normal D&D combat. I myself have played through dozens of ritual encounters from various DMs and even ran a few myself. And unfortunately, I don't think any of those encounters were great. The basics of the ritual encounter are pretty easy to understand and implement. The heroes see that some sort of ritual is taking place and must stop it before it is completed or something very bad happens. Let's use the little example I just went through. The party gets to the top of the hill and sees a bunch of gnolls obviously performing some kind of ritual. We have three core pieces to this encounter. One of those pieces is the party, the heroes, who have identified those gnolls are up to something and must now fight to stop it. The second piece are all the gnolls who aren't active key members of the ritual. These gnolls I'll call the defenders, as they are going to fight the heroes to make sure the ritual is not interrupted. The final piece is those two big gnolls with the fancy hats actually leading and performing the ritual. These guys I'll just call the leader, because they aren't going to do anything in the combat unless forced to stop what they're already doing, the ritual. Three key parts, the party, the defenders, and the leader. The party is going to try to stop or kill the leader, but to do that, they'll have to get through the defenders first. So now that we have that figured out, we have a few more things to think about. First, what happens if the party fails to stop the ritual? This is kind of a big deal, as it can very easily happen. This answer kind of depends on the encounter and your campaign, but generally you have a few different options. The easiest thing is to make it summon a tougher enemy for the party to then have to fight. In our case, the gnolls might summon some sort of demon to help them kill the party and then attack the nearby village. You could also make some story thing happen that kind of depends on your game, if this encounter is integral to your game's story. If the party was on a long streak of hunting and killing gnolls, and the gnolls are the main threat to the area, maybe I'll make the consequence of the ritual more severe, like all gnolls in that part of the world are now more powerful and fierce. Maybe some NPC's life is at stake. What if instead of a raging bonfire, the gnolls are performing a sacrificial ritual, and they're going to kill the local wizard and feed his soul to appease some demon or something? There really are endless options, but defining the fail state of the ritual encounter is pretty important. Now we have to think about what else could stop the ritual early besides the death of the leader. If the thing they're performing the ritual on is a great big bonfire, a player may see this and cast a water spell on it to try to put it out. Does that work? If not, how can you make that obvious so that the player doesn't waste a turn and a spell slot trying to come up with a clever solution? You can describe the fire as blazing hot, so hot that you can feel the heat from a hundred feet away, and everything around it should vaporize, far too hot to stand next to, and yet the gnolls scream and bark and dance, the fangs of Yunogu practically in the fire themselves, sweating and chanting but somehow, some way, not burning just yet. Some players can be really clever, and come up with all sorts of weird ways to stop your ritual without killing the leader. Generally, unless I thought I made it clear that something wouldn't work, I allow my players' weird ideas to work. It sets a good example that, hey, not everything has to be a straightforward fight. You can use your brain and be rewarded for it. However, also be clear that stopping the ritual early without killing the leader means that the leader now has nothing better to do than to help the defenders kill those meddling kids. It's a double-edged sword. Finally, the most important part of the ritual encounter. How long does the party have to stop the ritual? This is the part that gets screwed up every single time in every ritual encounter I've ran and played in so far. You need to make this obvious. If the party doesn't know how long they have, they'll never see the encounter as fair. If they failed, it's because you made it too quick. If they succeeded, 
It's because you didn't want them to fail and probably just gave it to them. You need to somehow define exactly how long they have to stop the ritual and make that painfully clear to the players. If the gnolls are at their bonfire, make sure to describe to the players what they should be looking for as the ritual proceeds. You see the skulls, then, adorning the monolith just behind the bonfire. Six in number, the small humanoid skulls look to have rubies stuck in their eye sockets. As the fire burns with hellish heat and the leader gnolls continue their chanting, you watch the ruby eyes of the skull on the far left begin to glow, radiating a strange indigo light. And then next round, you say, Your eyes are drawn to the second skull from the left adorning the monolith behind the raging fire, and watch as its ruby eyes begin to take on the same strange glow as the skull beside it. Watching it for a moment, you see the process begins again for the third, though the gems are still mostly dim for now. This is a very obvious sort of progress bar for the ritual. Once all those skulls light up, bad things happen, and the players understand that. Of course, you can and should still give it some wiggle room. Maybe the first skull doesn't light up until the second round. Maybe after all skulls are lit, it still takes an additional round for bad things to happen. The timing of the ritual should mostly be based on how tough the defenders are and how many other obvious options the players have for stopping the ritual early without having to go through the defenders and leaders. Also keep in mind how your leaders will react to getting attacked. Do they have to keep focusing on the ritual or performing a specific action? Do they just have to be in the same place for the whole time? Is the ritual tied directly to their life or willingness to carry out the ritual? Etc, etc. You can, of course, do a variety of different things with the sort of progress bar. Maybe the leader is executing captives and sacrificing them, so once he's out of prisoners, it's game over. Pretty obvious. Maybe blood or molten rock is filling up the grooves of some ancient artifact, and once it's filled, it lights out. It could be anything, really, but it has to be obvious to the players and progress uniformly with time. Using this method also opens you up to not using it, if that makes sense. What I mean is that after you use this sort of standard procedure for your ritual encounters, your players will get used to the formula, and when that formula doesn't appear, they'll know that something's up. For instance, if the players arrive too late to the ritual site, maybe they took too many rests on their way there. They've arrived too late, and now there is no progress bar. You know, maybe the leader is active in the combat from the start. There aren't as many defenders, or maybe there's more defenders. Something like that to shake up the formula, to communicate to the players, this is no longer a standard ritual encounter. One final note about specifically the leaders of your ritual encounter. Be sure that the leader is directly tied to the success or failure of the ritual. If the players kill my two big gnolls, then the ritual should be over. If I made some other random knoll that they were fighting go over and start chanting and doing the ritual, then what was the point of having the two big leaders? It's really cheap and kind of unfair. Make sure that the players can correctly identify the leader or leaders, and once those leaders are removed, that's it for the ritual. This whole topic reminded me of a particular ritual encounter from a few months ago in the current campaign I'm running that I may have to do a video on, but that's a whole other topic for another time. So this is my advice for ritual encounters in D&D, to ensure that they're mostly fun for everyone involved. I hope you enjoyed and maybe learned something, and I'll see you next time.